for our fun time yesterday. And uh, those of you who didn't make it to the Sunday School picnic will just tell you now that you missed a good time. It was a real nice time of fun and fellowship yesterday. And the Lord uh, kept the rain off us and gave us a nice warm, dry day. This morning, before I get started, I would like to let Jerry introduce his relatives, um, because I'm really bad at names. Jerry? And uh, while you're up. Um, This morning, I would like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I would like to begin a two or three part series on the subject of faith on the subject of faith Faith is one of the basic doctrines of Scripture. It also happens to be, I would judge, one of the most misunderstood words in our society and in the realm of religion as a whole. For the last four or five Sundays and continuing on for a few more weeks this summer, we have been going back and putting an emphasis on some basic fundamental doctrines that every Christian needs to be well grounded in. They are doctrines over which there is much confusion and they are teachings which hold a grave responsibility for each one of us. And that is that we would not assume that we are fully aware of the terms of these words but that we become convinced and assured within us that we ourselves have experienced the genuine article as it were of these truths we have looked at repentance how that repentance isn't getting down on your knees in front of a church and sobbing your heart out to God and crying out to Him in mercy so that He would save you. Repentance in the Scripture basically is having a clear-cut change of thinking, a change of mind. The Greek word is metanoeo, uh, an afterthought. You have come to a new understanding about yourself as God sees you, as God says you are, and you agree with that and you change your thinking. No one gets saved without repentance. We looked at conversion last Sunday. How that conversion doesn't mean joining a religious group or joining some church. Conversion basically is having a total change of direction which accompanies or follows a change of mind. And it is quite possible for unsaved people to get converted. That is our aim. So that they would come to Jesus Christ and as a consequence, as an end result, have a complete about face in their lives and begin to live for Him. Christians sometimes need to be reconverted, that is, not re-saved, but to have a change of direction in their lives. And the Scriptures definitely teach that. This morning, our subject is faith. The dictionary gives numerous definitions for this word. I will give you a couple. They say, it says that faith can be an allegiance to duty. Faith can be the belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion. Faith can be a firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Faith can be something that is believed, especially with strong convictions. And I'm here to tell you this morning that while these may be valid definitions of faith in the everyday world, they all fall short of biblical faith. If that would, if the, any one of these define what you consider your faith to be like, then you need to get saved. You need to really believe according to the Bible. I have met people on the street 
and in school and in other places where they say, well, I have faith. I'm growing in the faith. They're convinced that they have trusted, that they're believing in God. And I'm convinced that they are deluded, self-deceived, tricked. And it's my responsibility as a preacher of God's word to remind you of something that is straightforward and plain and simple and the Bible gives us definitions for its own terms that we must go by. This morning, if you consider yourself a Christian, be sure that you are not self-deceived, that you are going on a false assumption that you have believed when in essence you have had an experience or are doing something that is really devoid or lacking essential ingredients. And if you do not claim to be a Christian this morning, my challenge is to you that you need to believe to be saved. Do you know that the word believe or faith or other synonyms like trust are foundational to salvation as taught in the scriptures? If you want to know more about what it means to believe, read the book of John. It's called by many people the gospel of belief. The word believe or faith occurs over 90 times in that book in the New Testament. Some time ago, we studied through the book of Romans here at Northland Bible College Chapel. And in going through piece by piece and over a long period of time, sometimes it's easy to get misconceptions or the wrong emphasis and the emphasis that I want to draw this morning is on this word faith because it's also a key theme of the Apostle Paul who wrote this book Romans is the classic exposition of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about it explains divine judgment man's sinfulness God's provision in sending Jesus Christ as Vince was saying earlier it explains how to live a victorious Christian life in chapters 6, 7, and 8 and the pitfalls that you can easily fall into. And then the whole last part of the book is dedicated to showing us the basic areas of our lives where there needs to be conversion, a change of direction, where we need to live as a Christian, different than the way we once lived before we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And in this book, the Apostle Paul uses the word faith and its synonyms over 60 times. Very familiar word to Paul. And in the third and fourth chapters of this book, he uses the word half of those times. And in the fourth chapter, where we are this morning, he uses the word more than he does in any other single chapter. So here's a logical place to begin with. What does Paul have to say about faith? And we're going to read this morning verses 16 to 22. And I'm convinced that in these verses we have a definition of faith par excellence. Particularly in verses 18 through 20, we have an elaboration, an exposition, an emphasis of the ingredients of biblical faith. It's easy to say, I believe in God. Or it's easy to say, I've trusted in Jesus Christ. And there's an awful lot of easy believism going on today in churches and over television and radio and in crusades. There's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon and say, I'm a Christian, I trusted in Christ. But looking at their lives, they're no different than they were before. And I'm convinced there's a lot of people that don't know what it really means to believe, but they use the word and think they have it. So let's get it clear. All right? Let's read verses 16 to 22 in Romans chapter 4. Paul says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which are not as though they were, who against hope, now this is talking about what Abraham did, 
who against hope believed in God in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be and being not weak in faith he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but was strong in faith giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness this is not an unimportant passage of scripture it's not old data that has nothing to do with 1984 because two verses later Paul says that it was not only written for Abraham but for us also to whom it shall be imputed today if we do the same thing and fulfill the same conditions that Abraham did the Bible is up to date the principles that God has established in his relationship with human beings he has always basically followed through the same method we read in Genesis chapter 15 the promise to Abraham Abraham was standing out underneath the starry sky and God had previously years in advance told Abraham Abraham I'm going to make you a father of a multitude of people more numerous than you can count as, as as many as the sand of the sea and the stars in heaven in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 it says Abraham looking up into the sky believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness now I'm getting a little ahead of myself there are conditions for faith there there's only one way to get saved there's only a certain way that real biblical faith occurs and it never occurs in other conditions other than this that is that we have got to recognize that we need something that God has a premium on he has salvation he has eternal life he has a wonderful future for us he has an abundant life here and now on this earth before we go to meet him and there are all kinds of other wonderful, precious promises, Peter says in 2 Peter 1, 4, that are contained in the scriptures. Multitudes of promises. But we've got to realize that we need those things. We've got to realize that we just don't automatically fall into this inheritance of having eternal life just because we're a good person. See, there's a foundational starting point that the scriptures are abundantly clear in. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 through 9 basically say that for by God's grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves faith or salvation is a gift from God not of works lest any man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works that God has before ordained that we should walk in them that is a uh, an irrefutable passage of scripture among many dozens of others that plainly declares that faith is not works that you've got to believe because if you just go bumbling on day by day living your life thinking you've got it made that you're saved and you're going to heaven and because you're a nice religious good moral upright standing citizen and never done anything terribly bad you're gonna you're gonna miss the goal you're not automatically saved because you're a good person scripture delineates a difference between faith and works and we never get there by our own works it's a gift from God now Paul is not emphasizing the works part here he's emphasizing the faith part and he's saying listen you're in need and he uses the example of Abraham all through the fourth chapter right from the first verse He's using Abraham for an example to his Jewish readers. Why is Abraham so significant? Well, because Abraham got some fantastic promises from God. He happens to be the first Jew, the father of the Jewish nations. And so whatever happened to him stands as heavy evidence for Jews of all time. And he happens to be the father of faith for Christians today. And in verse 16 Paul is talking about the promise that God made to Abraham that the promise could be sure to Abraham that he really would have an innumerable number of progeny or seed as the word that Paul uses and that it only came to Abraham one way a Abraham never got the this multitude of people 
by keeping rituals that God gave through Moses. That was impossible because Moses wasn't born for another 400 years. The law had no, you know, no bearing on the matter. The only thing that Abraham was, was a pro had was a promise from God and himself. He was in need. The reason he was in need is because he was an old man. He didn't have any children. And that was uh, not a nice thing to have happen to you in that particular culture. Large families was the thing. And if you were blessed with children, then it was assumed that you were blessed by God. Very contrary to our culture today. They're ki killing them. right? But Abraham was in need. And Sarah was barren. And they needed children for their own uh, emotional well-being. And so they were in need. And so God comes along who is sovereign. And I love the description of God that we see in verse 17. Paul goes on a sideline here and he two things about God he gives. It, it describes him whom he believed, even God, number one, who quickens the dead, and number two, calls those things which are not as though they were. Our God is able to give eternal life, resurrection life. He can do the ultimate. Now, I've seen faith healers on television, but I've never seen one do this. Right? I've heard wild claims, but I've never seen it. And I don't believe it either. Only God gives eternal life. Only God raises from the dead. And that's the kind of God we have. Now, right away, you've got to, you we're faced with the miraculous, with the supranatural. See, what kind of a God do you have? Is he got a, are you trying to fit God into a human mold that can only do, and you only expect from him what human beings can do? Or do you believe that he's a sovereign, all-powerful, creator God of this magnificent universe that has made man his highest creature in his image and in his likeness? And he has a message for us. Is that the kind of God you have? I hope so. Because right? you'll never be interested in biblical faith nor salvation with a low concept of God because you think you're good enough yourself. God says you're a dirty, rotten sinner. You're headed for hell. There's nothing good that you can do in his sight, naturally. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's scripture. And so God is a God who quickens the dead, gives life to them. That's the ultimate miracle. And the other thing is, he calls those things which are not as though they were. God operates on a whole new level, a whole different ball game from you and I. We are creatures limited basically to our five senses, right? To the tangible, to the visible, to the things we can touch, feel, hear, and smell, and taste. You see. Now, God isn't bound by the, the five senses of, the, of his creatures. He created those senses. And they are only a finite replica, limited edition of what he possesses in the infinite. You see. And God says that there are things that you and I can't see. We can't experience in the bodies that we now have. Paul says that flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. God calls those things which are not as though they were. Uh, God says that there is a future. God says in his word that there is a heaven. God says in his word that Jesus Christ is coming back and he's going to give every Christian a new body that's related to the present body we now have. He says that there are rewards laid up for us in heaven, that there is an eternal inheritance reserved for us. He says that there is going to be no more sorrow, tears, suffering, nor crying. He says that we're going to see him face to face and there's going to be intimate fellowship. He says a lot of things, but we don't see them. And if we're so stubborn and ignorant to say, I will not believe it until I see it, then you're going to miss out. Because there's a lot of things, even in this life here and now, that you can't see, that you can only measure with instruments, but you can't feel it or smell it or taste it or measure it very much. Like gravity or electricity or other things that are like invisible things, but they're real. See, And God has instituted these things. And there are examples of the spiritual realm that he says is 
Now, are we going to agree and acknowledge that there is a sovereign God who is all-powerful, who can make promises that are supra, beyond the natural? It's only as we recognize that there is this kind of a God who exists and recognize our own need that we'll ever bother about the promises that God makes to us because people that are filled with their own power, their own ability, their own purposes, their own plans, their own lifestyle, their own everything, they're their, their, their own little gods. So they're not worried about what the God says. It's important that we understand that there is an all-powerful God that we're someday going to bow down and face personally, and he's going to judge us. And we need what he offers us right now. And so God made promises to Abraham. God, of his own free will, for nothing that Abraham deserved, because Abraham was a sinner too, and we have his fails recorded in the book of Genesis, says, Abraham, I have chosen you, and I'm going to give you a multitude of children, and fill your coffers full and make you a rich man. And all you've got to do is read Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, down to chapter 22 to read those and uh, you, you find the promises of God the promise Paul actually quotes it in verse 18 according to that which was spoken quote unquote so shall thy seed be that was the promise that God made to Abraham this is just a standing example for us right it's an illustration of the kinds of promises that God makes to us all right so these are the conditions do you this morning admit that you need what God offers you do you admit that you cannot provide for yourself eternal life or righteousness or favor in God's sight? Do you recognize that only God can do it? And do you recognize that he has made promises to you in his word? Okay, if you recognize those conditions, then you are ripe for exercising biblical faith. And only when you recognize and fulfill those conditions, will you be able to respond in biblical faith? What are the responses of faith? First of all, in verse 18, the first thing that true faith does is that it assents to a divine promise. What God says, it believes. Abraham, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. And the verse doesn't end there. The verse goes on to say, according to that which was written or spoken, so shall thy seed be. You see that the relationship between Abraham on earth and God in heaven hinged on something that God said to Abraham. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a bunch of children. And there's no way that Abraham um, could see those children he couldn't see the means to those children. His wife had a physical problem and she couldn't have children. See, there, there, was no, there was no visible way in sight for him to really say, well, I'm, I'm sure because I can see it. God doesn't show us our eternal life beforehand. He promises it, just like he promised the children. Okay? So there were, is an unseen end. He couldn't see down to the end of the road, but... This was the promise. God said, this is the way it's going to be. And so what was belief? What was Abraham's faith all about? He believed in something he couldn't fully see, fully understand. This is the way it always was. If you, well, why don't we? Let's turn to, hold your finger in Romans 4 and just go to Hebrews 11 with me for a moment. Hebrews 11 is called the, the faith chapter in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11. And I'd like you to read verse 7 and 8 with me. And, and we could multiply the verses in this chapter to illustrate the same point. Paul says in Romans 4, Abraham believed against hope. <laughs> he had been waiting for a hundred years. He was a hundred-year-old man. And for a long time, he and his wife had been waiting for children. And the situation was hopeless. Hopeless, against hope. He couldn't see any way. This is the thing, that the first thing we focus our attention on. I can't see any way that how my body's going to be changed and how Jesus Christ is coming back to heaven. I've never even seen Jesus. I've never seen any of the apostles. Vince has. 
<laughs> right? But the point is, is that this is the way it always was. Do you realize that Noah had never seen rain? Now get, get this clear. Do you realize that Noah had never seen rain? Because it was only through the flood where the fountains of the earth were broken and the curtains of the, of the things up in heaven were broken that the whole atmospheric relationship in the earth was changed. And then there was rain. But you read in Genesis chapter 4 or Genesis chapter 2 and other places that the earth was watered with a mist that came off the ground. It came up instead of came down, coming down. And this is what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, He'd never seen a flood. He'd never seen rain. That's why they thought he was a fool. Right? It was kind of ridiculous. He'd never, you know. Invisible realities according to God. And humanly speaking, ridiculous. Ridiculous. Look at the next verse. By faith Abraham, when he was called by God to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing where he went. He'd never been to the promised land. He didn't know where God was leading him. See? And so, if you want to get saved, you've got to realize that God makes promises that he expects you to believe in his ability. He ex he's going to make promises to you, he has in his word, about things that are unmeasurable, intangible, invisible, just like he is. That doesn't mean they're unreal. They're very real. They're as real as he is. So getting back to Romans chapter 4, the first thing is that against all reason, true faith, like Abraham, who was the father of faith demonstrated, believed in something that he never seen before. The second thing that we read in verse 19 is that he responded to in a certain way to the things that he could see, to the visible barriers of the promise. God said, I'm going to give you a multitude of inhabitants. And he had one wife, and she couldn't have children. And it goes on, it says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Sarah's womb. In the first part of verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. I, I just want to make a comment here on these verbs here. Literally, it reads this way in the Greek. Not having become weak, Abraham did not consider, that is, he did not fix his eyes or focus his attention on uh, his own body, who was almost as good as dead, and his wife's barren womb. He didn't focus all his attention. He didn't consider it. And that's what we're talking about now. True faith, number one, believes what God says is going to happen in the end. And at the same time, true faith, secondly, doesn't look all around and focus on all the impossibilities and all the things that argue against it and say it can't happen. It doesn't focus its unbelieving eyes on the things that don't make sense. What do you mean God is going to send his son? What do you mean there's eternal life? What do you mean there's rewards in a judgment seat? I've never seen any of those things. Well, what about the evidence for a God that exists here and now, and there is much evidence for it? And if you want, you can talk to Mike after, because he's memorized all the naturalistic, theistic arguments, the cosmological, teleological, and anth anthropological arguments for the existence of God. That are, You don't have to accept them on faith. You look around the world and you can see it. There's evidence that there is a God. You see, well... Abraham didn't look at his shriveled up old body and he didn't look into the face of his wife and shake his head and say, that can't be true, God's not going to give me children. Even though he'd been waiting for years and years. He didn't focus all his attention. That's what the word, did not consider, fix his eyes on. He did not stagger, that is, doubt or hesitate or be at variance with. He did not just say, ah, garbage, can't happen. See, true faith doesn't reject the promises of God based on its limited, finite, present vision. And that's what a lot of people do. They turn away from the Word and the promises of God because of the here and now and what they do see. You've got to be careful. Really careful. 
Instead, as Hebrews 12, 2 says, we should be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and he's the one that began it, he's the one that's going to finish it, and he's the one that's given the evidence and the promises now. So you've got to focus our attention on the promises. And finally, the third response of real biblical faith is dependence on divine ability. In verse, the latter part of verse 20 and, and all of verse 21 says, But Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was imputed to him. Now, this is really getting down to the crux of the matter. Okay, it's one thing to believe what somebody promises you is going to happen. That's part of faith. You've got to accept it on simple blind faith. That's what it is, blind faith because you've never seen it before. But at the same time, it's not merely blind faith. True biblical faith accepts something blindly that it has never seen, but at the same time, it does not reject what it hasn't seen by what it does see. And the reason it does both of those things is because of the third factor. And this is the determinative factor. And that is that there is a certain kind of a God. All our hope rests in God. What kind of God is He? He's an able God. He's an able God. And that four-letter word is the nicest four-letter word you'll ever hear. He's an able God. God. That is, he has the ability to do what he says. Now, I have made promises to my children on occasion, I don't try to make a habit of it, that I am unable to fulfill. You know, I'm driving down the highway and we're late for an appointment. And so Amanda says, I'd like to stop at Dairy Queen for an ice cream cone. I said, oh, well, okay. Okay. So I just made a promise. But I'm late and then something comes happen unexpected and I can't do it. So we don't stop. Okay. I was unable to fulfill the promise. But that never happens with God. This is the whole thing with Abraham. Abraham was successful because, not of his own ability, but because he be, put his hand in the hand of God who was able. See, Let's read it again. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. You see that? That's not an isolated verse. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, we have Paul's own personal testimony about God's ability. He says, I am not ashamed. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 11 and 19. I'll go back to Hebrews because it's important. Hebrews 11, verses 11 and 19. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Verse 19. Abraham accounting that God was able to raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure. You see... Abraham, later on, was even willing to kill the only son that God gave him, the first one. The only measurable, visible hope to having an innumerable seed. Why? Because God, uh, Abraham was convinced beyond a doubt in the kind of God that he had, that God was able to raise up his son that he was commanded to kill. Abraham believed that God was able to give him a land that he had never seen before. Noah believed that God was able to make it do something that he'd never seen before, to make this monstrosity that he spent a good portion of his life making float to deliver him. See, do you believe that God is able to do what he says? That he's able to give you life? He's able to give you victory over your habits of life, your sin? Do you, able, do you believe that God is able to deliver and set you free for eternity? There's a lot of promises there. And it all boils down to God's ability. Paul says in one of his prayers in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even can conceive of. All right. 
So what I've been trying to impress on you this morning is that faith is not some mystical, self-oriented, religious term. It is a biblical, vital, living concept that is found in the pages of Scripture. And if we will exercise that kind of thing, then we can have the certainty that we are truly saved. What is your faith like? Are you resting in the promises of God? There is no faith without trusting promises. Are you overlooking the things of this life that are problematic, such as God allowing suffering and sickness and sorrow and disasters? Are you overlooking the visible barriers? Are you ultimately resting in those promises that God makes because it's God that makes them? He can do it even if I can't conceive of any possible way? Faith is simply not a mystical thing. It's, it's acting on, the, on invisible but real realities because God makes them realities. Now I know there's been a lot of theoretical doctrine here this morning. And I appreciated Paul's very practical instruction this morning. God's Word is both practical, it is philosophical, it is theoretical, but whatever it is, you've got to experience it if you want to see Jesus Christ. You've got to go this way. There is no other way. Rest in the promises of God who is able to keep them. Don't try to depend on your own limited and unacceptable ability to reach the Father. Let's pray. Lord, help us as one man in whose words are recorded in the New Testament said to Jesus, Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to let go of the troubles that sidetrack us, that confuse us. Lord, we don't claim to know everything but we claim to know you who knows everything. You are able to do more than we can. Our hope rests in you and in your provision, not in our abilities and our feeble efforts. Lord, open the minds and hearts of anyone here that might up till now have been depending on their own efforts, their own abilities. Help them to realize that the only hope rests in the promises of an able God. We pray that you will dismiss us this week. Help us to go forth with an accurate, crystal clear message to those to whom we witness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.